Good morning. I'm Inge Borchert from Sussex. As a Deputy Program Chair, it's a distinct pleasure to welcome you all to this year's RES plenary session on Brexit, the view from abroad. The stakes in Brexit are high. Depending on the yet-to-be-determined uh, conditions, the impact across the economy and across society, that matter, are potentially large. So it is fit and proper for the economics profession to have a discussion on the issue as the process unfolds. We have an excellent lineup uh, of panelists, and I am delighted to introduce Martin Sandbu from the Financial Times as a panel's chair. His commentary is wildly read and highly respected, um, so it is, it is terrific to have him at Sussex today. So without further ado, let me hand the floor to Martin Sandbu, and please join me in welcoming the panelists and the chair. Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's great to see so many of you here. I hope not too many people have problems with the trains uh, getting here. But we're here, and uh, it's going to be a very exciting session. Uh, all of you, at least the huge majority of you who are economists, will be aware, I think, of the criticism of the profession, um, especially from these student movements trying to reform economics who complain that Economists are abstract and otherworldly and don't have anything to say about the big policy issues of the day. Well, they obviously should have come to RES conference because this session is very much about one of the big policy issues of the day. Uh, and I think we will demonstrate very clearly that economists do have a lot to say uh, about Brexit that is both well-informed theoretically and immediately applicable and relevant in a practical sense. Uh, now, if you, like me, follow the nitty-gritty of the Brexit negotiations in detail every day, uh, you might think that there's nothing new we can learn about Brexit. We sort of talked it to death. Uh, I've had a sort of sneak preview of the presentations, and I'm very excited to tell you that that's not the case. There is a lot more to learn, um, and that's what we're going to do today. Let me just very briefly, not even introduce, but just list our excellent uh, panelists. We have uh, Michael Berda from the Humboldt University in Berlin and Rob Steger from Dartmouth College, who will give the first two presentations, giving a view from abroad uh, on Brexit. Uh, and then Alan Winters of Sussex, uh, who's, also, uh, who's also set up the UK Trade Policy Observatory, uh, and Meredith Crowley from Cambridge will give their responses and their reactions to those presentations. And then, as soon as possible, we'll try to make this not just a set of presentations, but a discussion, which will include you, uh, because this will be a topic where you all have something you'll want to say. So we'll try to have as much audience participation as possible in the last bit of the session. Uh, so I'm going to hand over right away uh, to Michael just to repeat what I've told the panelists. I will be quite strict on the timing so that we do leave time at the end for discussion. So you have 12, 13 minutes each. Hopefully the uh, slides will all be on this computer uh, and work well. So please, Michael, why don't you start and uh, we'll take it from there. Okay, I'm delighted to be here. It's a great honor. Um, this is a really difficult issue, and we really don't know what's happening. Uh, we really, literally, don't know. Um, I'm sitting, I'm sitting in Germany, and I've I've had the pleasure of being the the author of the letter from uh, Germany for the past uh, three years, and it's really interesting to see how that's evolved. I mean, I'm an American. I'm living in Germany, looking at the UK. My mother was from the UK, so that's kind of my background. Uh, uh, she was always against the U EU. And her sister and my, all my older relatives were against the EU. And I've always kind of, that's fascinated me. And I think I really, this, this past year has helped me understand why that's the case. So I'm going to take you through a very quick presentation on, on this. I want to talk about the earthquakes, the political stuff. Remember, Lionel and Robbins talked about the difference between normative and, econo and positive economics. 
And I think we can't really get our minds around this unless we do the positive economics. What motivated enough people to vote the way they did uh, last year? Uh, or two years ago, almost. And we've seen this again and again. I think this is kind of a blowback from globalization. And I'm going to spend most of my time talking about the labor market implications. Because I think the labor market is the most essential, you know, human existence is very important in general. And people earning their existence in the labor market is, is, is kind of what it's all about. This is coming back to us now. And, and I'm being reminded of stuff I learned about in history, European history, uh, the ghosts of, of the past. And we're seeing this in Central Europe more, more so than in the UK. Um, the UK has always impressed me as being a very liberal place, in the, not just in the economic sense, but also in the tradition of being progressive. Uh, but we see that winners and losers are now becoming so evident, uh, and they're making their voices be heard. So here's my, here's my take on this. I teach this in, uh, at the Humboldt University. I teach a course called European Integration, and it's a, it's a take on, it's a little bit like Baldwin Wiplow's. Charles Wiplow's is a good friend of mine, but I, I go for the factor markets. I'm really interested in capital mobility and labor mobility especially. And I think this is something we didn't pay enough attention to when we talk about the four freedoms and the, um, the, 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 the liberalization of, of European activity in general. And I think this is what really is my point. This, my, my brief intervention is going to be about how this has affected political economy in the UK and especially um, in places you wouldn't have expected where there aren't any foreigners. Okay? So I'm, you know, this is what I teach in my class, capital mobility, labor mobility, and of course trade. Trade is everyone gains from trade. Diffuse gains, no one uh, really loses unless you're a, a producer competing with the, uh, with the, uh, in, in, with the imports. Uh, we've got other things going on as well. And you know, after, after the 1992 uh, treaty, um, we've seen an acceleration of these forces and we've seen this setback. So I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about the so-called four freedoms. I, I phrase it a little bit differently from the, the, the wording in the, in the treaty. Because uh, I think ideas are important, the ideas of, of, of political freedom, for example. But we've, we've also got to talk about the other aspects of the EU which may uh, have to be renegotiated upon uh, Brexit. We know it's going to happen now. Um, we're talking about things that don't, no one talks about. Common, common pharmaceutical regulation, very advantageous to people who take drugs uh, in this country and other countries. Uh, common regulation of, of universities, of standards of, of labor. Uh, practices, environmental standards, criminal law enforcement. We've also seen that you know spy agencies working together can also be very effective in certain instances is in most recent days. So you know why did why do we have Brexit? So the political economy, the positive side. Why do we have this? I think it's about movement of people. So I, I read this really interesting paper by by Alan Manning and a student about alienation and what what this does. And the most obvious form of alienation people have, especially in a country like Europe where we're a bunch of tribes basically, and I've lived in Europe for 25 years now, uh, I, know, I know what I'm talking about, it's um, Europeans have problems dealing with change. And this is kind of what uh, we see when you look at surveys. You survey people and ask them what uh, turns them off about, about immigration, for example. And it's usually about, it's about a feeling about a threat um, a threat that they sort of vaguely associate with trade and goods and services, but they also see uh, their own jobs being threatened, and uh, they feel estranged, they feel like their main street has been changed. This is what, what Alan Manning in his paper has talked about, the fact that it's just perceptions. It's not even, not even necessarily true. I mean, the worst blowback against uh, migration in Germany is coming from places where there are no foreigners. It's more about the change and the perception. Um, so obviously, it's, a, it's about labor mobility, it's about that being under attack. Um, and I think it's important to, to actually to call us a spade a spade in the United States. Uh, we would uh, look very carefully, I mean, especially nowadays, uh, about these types of, of changes. The, the Germans actually are part of the, the problem. I think the Germans actually, uh, by deferring Polish migration in, in, in 2003, when, when Poland acceded uh, to the European Union and the rest of Eastern Europe, a lot of this, in, this immigration came to the UK. So the UK bore a brunt of a very fruitful, positive, productivity-enhancing uh, movement of people, um, and to Sweden as well. And of course, the Germans were able to insulate their economy for a few years, and, uh, and we see now the, the things are starting to equalize. I'll show you the, the data in a second. But the big thing for the UK was this, this recent issue, issue of the, the Syrian migration. And I think that kind of brought a lot of people uh, to the realization that um, what's going to happen when these people come, Germany has its next recession, and the people move on. And I think. Um, we have to deal with this. We, we may not think it's right. We may be against xenophobia, but in the end, it's part of the political economy. And if we don't deal with it, we're going to have more problems in the future. And it's interesting to look at the data. The, mo the most important data that I've, I've found interesting is the drop in migration 
net migration as well as uh, gross migration to the UK since, since this vote. Um, and it's, uh, it's quite disturbing. It means to me that, if it says to me, I mean, I've always thought of the EU as being a customs union. Uh, and, and just after, after I came to Europe in 1987, the, the notion of capital mobility, free movement of capital between Germany and France, for example, was kind of on the table, and then people started moving, and recognition of, of professions. These are all very progressive ideas, and you're, you're kind of stuffing this down uh, people's uh, gullets in, in, a, in a matter of decades. It's difficult, and I think we have to deal with the political economy. Okay, so, you know, the perception of, of the loss of industry, loss of high-paying jobs, um, we know that we're gaining from cheaper goods, and this country has gained probably the most of all, uh, being a global trader. Uh, the, the gains are unevenly distributed in the sense that people may lose their, their jobs and they may lose their familiar atmosphere. This is the Alan Manning point. Um, we also have this problem of social media, which in my country, in my home country, has, has caused much, much, many problems, many, many um, divisive uh, forms of behavior, which I never saw when I was growing up. And we've lost a lot of our own credibility. So one thing that bothers me as an economist is people don't talk about us seriously anymore. It's almost like a, we're, we're, we're an advocate, we're a lobbyist for a certain uh, uh, elite or, or not for the little guy. Okay, so, you know, this disagreement is not just within a country, it's also across countries. So I've, I've looked at the, the Euro barometer, uh, and it's, a, it's fascinating that Europe can disagree so much about this issue. So you have the Scandinavian countries, which seem to have gotten together. The, uh, they've figured out that maybe you need to compensate the losers. You have to retrain the losers. So Denmark has this lifelong learning thing. You see them on the left-hand side of this, fig this, this, this uh, picture, which is supposed to be given basically uh, the same question, hopefully offered in the same, in the same way. Uh, a huge majority of people see globalization as a positive aspect in Scandinavia. And on the other end, you've got France and Cyprus and Greece, where most people see themselves as, as losers. So it's, it's even within the country, you've got these, di these dif differences. You've, you've always got the people who profit from, from globalization in every country, from, from increased trade, but you've got this, uh, this distribution across countries. So this is a huge, a huge fractionalization of Europe, um, and I think it's actually <coughs> persistent. This is the 2014 version of a very similar question. Uh, and then you've got this perception of loss of control. So you talk, talk to a lot of old people in this country. Uh, I talk to my relatives, and they tell me that they feel like you know, other people are determining their, their future. And it's usually Germany. Okay? So this is an, an amazing uh, survey by the Pew Research Center about where, who's got the locus of, <laughs> where the locus of control is. And it seems to me like, I mean, this fat, the Germans were not asked in this survey. <laughs> and the Germans have a different answer, actually. Uh, so 48% of the people think that, you know, that, that the majoritarian, but not the absolutely, you know, superimposing country has all the power. So this, this, this loss of control sort of translates into the political sphere as well. And despite that, you've got this absolutely schizophrenic uh, reaction in terms of the Brexit uh, vote actually has turned into a, a, a boon for the countries that have remained. People have found the, the EU actually a pretty good thing. And the UK has also had a sort of slight resurgence of interest and approval of what's going on. So it's, it's incredible to think about this. And I think it's, uh, you know, we, we, we know that we have to ask as economists. This is, this is where I get really emotional about it. I mean, we have never, I learned trade in, in graduate school. We only looked about the gains and we didn't talk about the distribution of the gains. So the political economy, how are those gains actually distributed? Just kind of lost, just kind of dropped off the page. And I think the, the fact that the biggest increase in inequality has generated the biggest interest in, in uh, rejection of globalization ideas in the UK, for example, also in the United States, um, and uh, less so in Scandinavia, perhaps some because of migration, it's uh, worth thinking about. And you know, think about who are the winners and the losers in this, in the Brexit. It's basically what our theory tells us. We're just not taking those differences seriously and driving as a driver of, of change and, and policy. And um, I'll, I'll finish by asking who are the winners? Are there any winners out there there are a lot of older people uh, who, you know, feel like Germany kind of, we beat Germany in the, in the war and, you know, why are they controlling us from Brussels with all these regulations? Um, but there are other people that are going to gain, okay? So let's, let's look at those. What do our theories tell us? You know, import competing, obviously, if you're not importing a lot of, uh, of, uh, of imports, you're going to have an increase in effective protection. Um, ironically, finance in France and Germany are going to benefit. Eastern European capitalists will benefit. Um, ironically, a lot of people in Poland who have done well in this country are going to go back, and they're already going back. We've seen the data. 
and they're going to do well. Um, this is where I get really upset, because the rent seekers get a lot of this. People have consulted on both sides of the aisle in this country are now joining hands and starting consultancies. It's just not right, right? Uh, Southern Europe is going to benefit because they will get more power vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Northern Europe, which tends to be more pro-market and possibly thinking more about market solutions. So I hate to say this, uh, I love France, I worked there for five years, but this is a, a consequence. And people who are not going to actually see this happen and they're not even going to bear the, the brunt of the change um, are also going to gain because uh, they feel good about it. Okay. So, I mean, who knows, this is an emotional reaction, but economists need to gain some insight into emotion and what drives these things, because if we don't, other people are going to do it for us. And we've, we've seen this in the United States, and we, we, we may have seen it here in this country. Um, I think Germany is, is going to be a loser because uh, they, they're losing the, the ally that the UK is actually in the press all the time, losing the, the liberal in the uh, European continental <coughs> sense, you know, pro-market uh, influence. And we're going to see uh, a lot of pressure now on, at least coming from Germany, on France to go a little bit easier on the UK. I, have to, I think we have to start asking, one, well, do we need all four freedoms? Can we kind of take a slow, a slow boat on the, on the final one, the freedom of labor, if you like, uh, as a price of saving uh, something very important to all of us? I think it would be a terrible waste of resources, and we'll see this later in the other talks. Uh, remember the motto of the European Union? Does anybody know that? See, you're all great Europeans. <laughs> this is almost identically the, 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 uh, the motto of the United States of America. Okay, so let's, let's kind of uh, take another look at that and maybe we can figure out a way to, to save the European Union. Thank you very much for your attention. Hey, it's a uh, pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm going to be uh, talking about Brexit, uh, not so much uh, from the North American uh, point of view, but more through the lens of a literature, an economics literature, that I'll refer to as the economics of trade agreements. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to organ uh, organize my comments. Yeah, five minutes left. OK, uh, so I'm going to organize my comments around three uh, questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, how deep should integration go? So that's a big question that I'm going to try to, uh, to answer from the point of view of some of the literature. Uh, secondly, what does the UK want from its trade agreements? That's a big question. I'm not going to have an answer for that, but I'm going to suggest that the literature can help us organize how we would think about an answer. And then third, what can the UK expect from trade negotiations with the US? And there, I'll have a little bit more to say from a US uh, perspective. So how deep should integration go? Well, we can think of a hard Brexit, which is what I'm going to take as the, uh, as the default, the kind of uh, most severe, uh, as two things. It's a rejection of deep integration uh, with the EU and return to WTO-type shallow integration with the EU. And then secondly, it's a rejection of preferential integration with the EU and a return to WTO-type non-discriminatory MFN integration with the EU. And according to uh, the uh, terms of trade theory of trade agreements, one of the central uh, theories of trade agreements, in principle, uh, the cost of the UK of giving up deep for shallow integration may actually be quite small, even in principle non-existent, uh, while the gains in sovereignty could actually be substantial. And at the same time, uh, the cost to the UK of giving up preferential liberalization for MFN integration may also be quite small, or even non-existent, uh, while the gains to the world trading system could actually be substantial. So those are two statements that are probably uh, not something that often people hear from economists. So let me go into at least a little detail in my 13 minutes. And let's take that first statement, and I'm going to explain in very brief terms why the literature would uh, support this view. Uh, so the cost of the UK of giving up deep for shallow integration may actually be small. Uh, the gains to sovereignty could be substantial. Uh, and the key point that I want to make is there are choices uh, that in how we approach uh, integration. And the GATT WTO uh, shallow integration approach, focusing on border measures with rules that handle uh, 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 behind the border measures, but not directly negotiating over those behind the border measures, has a legitimacy uh, according to the terms of trade theory. Uh, and what that legitimacy says or suggests is that shallow integration does not need to be seen as a weakness of a trade agreement. Uh, in fact, according to the terms of trade theory, 
uh, a trade agreement that has GATT's basic structure, the precursor to the WTO, uh, under such an agreement, shallow integration could in principle achieve international efficiency, where the efficiency is defined by the preferences of the member governments. Uh, secondly, um, this kind of structure in, in principle could be extended to services under the GATS, the GATS of the WTO. Uh, that's very important for the UK. Uh, and third, national sovereignty does not need to be in principle compromised in order to achieve international efficiency in a globalized uh, setting. So that's, those are very strong uh, positions, and of course there are caveats to all of those, and in 13 minutes I don't have time to put in the caveats, but I think the key thing that, uh, as, as a Brexit debate, uh, what to do with, uh, with Brexit, now that you've uh, uh, embarked on that, a uh, key thing is uh, uh, it should be realized that uh, the literature really does suggest that shallow integration is not uh, a crazy idea, that uh, uh, in principle, uh, one, can, uh, one can actually uh, achieve quite a bit from shallow integration along the lines of the GATT and the WTO. Uh, okay, what about the second statement? The cost of the UK of giving up preferential for MFN integration may be small, even non-existent, while the gains to the world trading system could be substantial. Well, again, according to the terms of trade theory, uh, the gains from negotiating reciprocal trade liberalization come from a very particular thing. Uh, it's not achieving free trade. That's not what uh, economists who study trade agreements would say trade agreements are about. Rather, it's about eliminating international externalities that would otherwise drive uh, distortions in the local markets of the countries that are, uh, that are imposing protection. So achieving reductions in the distortions of local prices is the key aspect that is the gain from, uh, from a trade agreement. Uh, and you need a trade agreement to help you achieve these uh, uh, reductions and distortions of local prices in order to mitigate the terms of trade losses that would otherwise occur if you were to unilaterally liberalize. Uh, and there's also a possible gain in, a, in any trade agreement, which might be uh, terms of trade gains that you might, uh, you might gain as well. Well, these latter, the terms of trade gains, those are uh, zero sum. Those really are just zero sum. It's my gain is your loss. The former are the source of the positive gains, uh, positive sum gains from a trade agreement that we can all gain from eliminating the distortions in our own economies that were there because we were imposing some of the costs of what we were doing onto other countries. Well, MFN integration, in principle, can achieve all of those former uh, benefits, all of the uh, positive sum gains of a trade agreement. Uh, preferential liberalization, well, that may give more uh, of the latter kinds of gains, the terms of trade gains, with respect to third countries. Uh, but in doing so, it's likely to sacrifice the former, the real gains that are the source of trade agreement gains, uh, and that comes through trade diversion. Okay, so I've given you a little bit of detail. Uh, I'm going to just move on, but I uh, encourage you to go read some of the literature if you're not familiar with it uh, and, uh, and see the, 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 more, uh, the more full explanation with, with caveats, et cetera. Uh, but what's the implication? Uh, well, if the goal of Brexit is to regain uh, UK national sovereignty while sacrificing minimal economic uh, efficiency, and if the terms of trade theory of trade agreements applies to the UK, then the UK's best post-Brexit option, in my view, is to throw its weight behind a strengthened and re-energized WTO. Because the WTO is that shallow integration uh, trade agreement that is there, that is wobbling, that needs uh, support, that needs improvement. Services, GATS, uh, there are many things that uh, would be very viable, very important to the UK that could be strengthened the WTO. And uh, there's, a, there's a direct line of thought from this literature that would say, that's what the UK should be doing uh, if it really if it wants to uh, make sense of what it did in le leaving Brexit. Well, this is one way, or of Brexit, this is one way to make sense of it, uh, is to uh, uh, throw its weight behind, uh, throw its weight behind the WTO. And of course, that's in some sense going back to the history of the GATT. Uh, James Mead, uh, British uh, economist, Nobel economist, was central in, de in designing uh, the GATT. And so it's not uh, as if Britain didn't have a and John Maynard Keynes, uh, it's not as if Britain didn't have a key, uh, a key role in designing uh, that institution. Okay, what does the UK want from its trade agreements? That's my second question. Uh, well, according to the terms of trade theory of trade agreements, uh, 
Countries use trade agreements to internalize the international externalities that their trade policies impose on other trading partners. And those international externalities travel through prices. Those are just the terms of trade, as that's the, tech, the uh, jargon that economists would use. Uh, and that allows them to escape from a terms of trade driven prisoner's dilemma. That's the terms of trade uh, story for what countries are actually doing with trade agreements. There's another uh, uh, well-known and, uh, uh, and classic uh, theory of trade agreements that I'll refer to as the commitment theory. Under the commitment theory, countries use trade agreements to help governments make policy commitments to their own private sectors, using trade agreements to tie my own hands rather than trying to internalize international externalities. Well, things like limits to state aid, that would be very relevant. The UK may be thinking that uh, by, uh, by being a member of the EU, it has to uh, uh, abide by limits to state aid, and that can help it stand up to its, uh, to its industries and say we can't subsidize. Maybe that's something that the UK wants. If so, that's uh, solving a domestic commitment problem that, uh, that something like uh, the EU would, would help. Okay, so that raises the question. According to the literature on trade agreements, uh, what does the UK want from its trade agreements? Well, to the extent that the terms of trade theory is relevant for the UK, uh, the previous slides that I just uh, uh, showed apply, and the best post-Brexit option is to support the WTO, just as I mentioned before. To the extent that the commitment theory is relevant for the UK, then seeking to negotiate uh, preferential trade agreements that are deep only along the dimensions where the commitment is desired by the UK makes a lot of sense. So I could imagine that a country might say, uh, the EU is too deep on too many things. We do not want to uh, use a trade agreement to commit and tie our hands on everything. But there are certain things we want to tie our hands on. We are going to find trade agreements that will help us tie our hands on those things we want, but give us freedom to do what we want on other things. That could be a very sensible uh, view of, uh, of what uh, the UK might do with its Brexit now that it has done it. But it all depends on what the UK wants uh, out of its trade agreement. Okay, finally, in my remaining three minutes, uh, what to expect from trade negotiations with the U.S.? Well, um, we can get a hint by looking at the Trump administration's vision for the global trade order and its behavior in the NAFTA renegotiations, although after yesterday, I could have easily used the, the uh, U.S.-Korea uh, renegotiations. That's the exact same point that I'm going to make here uh, applies even better there because it's actually happened. Uh, what is the Trump administration's ideal global trade order? Uh, well, Wilbur Ross, the U.S. Commerce Secretary, has said it very well. He said, an ideal global trading system would facilitate adoption of the lowest possible level of tariffs. In this ideal system, countries with the lowest tariffs would apply reciprocal tariffs to those with the highest and then automatically lower that reciprocal tariff as, as, the, as the other country lowers theirs. This leveling technique could be applied product by product or across the board on an aggregate basis. Such a modification would motivate high tariff countries to reduce their tariffs on imports. Okay, so what's the purpose of a trade agreement, according to Wilbur Ross and presumably Donald Trump? I think it's to achieve ultimately reciprocal free trade or at least a level playing field. If you're going to have a 10% duty on your import of cars, then I'm going to have a 10% duty on my import of your cars. That's the, the level playing field, according to Wilbur Ross. What, does, what are the means of achieving this purpose? going to abandon MFN because if uh, Europe has a 10% duty on cars, I'm going to slap the U.S. a 10% duty on cars from Europe. But if Mexico uh, or if, uh, uh, if Canada has a 2% duty on cars, I'll put a 2% duty on cars from, uh, from Canada. And I'm going to match product by product, country by country, uh, everybody's duty. Well, that is clearly uh, completely abandoning MFN. It's pursuing bilateral bargains, as we've seen Trump is, is doing. And finally, it's reciprocity in tariff levels, uh, meaning we are going to match tariff for tariff, country for country, the level of the tariffs. Well, uh, in case you doubt this, here's an, uh, in, a tweet from Donald Trump recently. When a country taxes our products coming in at, say, 50 percent, and we tax the same product coming into our country at zero, not fair or smart. We will soon be starting reciprocal taxes so that we will charge the same thing as they charge us. Okay, very clearly stated. And in my view, what that essentially is saying is it's a repeal and replace view of global trade order. Uh, it really is an ex existential challenge to the pillars of the GATT WTO architecture, which are MFN, totally being abandoned, I would say, by, the, by at least the words and now somewhat the deeds of the uh, Trump administration. And it emphasizes a form of reciprocity, and this is really uh, insidious in a way because reciprocity is a key pillar 
the WTO, but it's not that kind of reciprocity. Trump and, uh, and Wilbur Ross are, represent, are talking about a reciprocity in tariff levels. Reciprocity in the GATT WTO is a reciprocity about negotiated changes. And that's, those are two very, very different things that lead to very different uh, outcomes. And finally, Wilbur Ross seems unhappy with uh, shallow integration uh, uh, of the WTO and wants to have some kind of a, uh, an approach to non-tariff barriers. And maybe that's uh, that there's a support for deep integration, provided that the U.S. has the ability to, to assert its bargaining power. Okay, finally, what about Trump's behavior in the NAFTA negotiations? Well, under MFN and reciprocity, the interesting thing is the, the WTO rules, it's a rules-based system, multilateral system, and it actually, while it serves the interests of the member governments, uh, to some degree, those rules are going to blunt the power of the dominant countries. And that's something that has been shown and can be shown. And it's an interesting question of why the dominant countries would have su uh, submitted to this. There are reasons for that. Uh, but what the Trump administration would like to do is assert its power over trading partners and bilateral bargains with things like bargaining tariffs, saying, if you don't do this, I'm going to jack my tariff up on you. And uh, I'm going to use that as a bargaining ploy to get you to do what I want. Uh, and the WTO helps to militate against that because why? Because I can't threaten to raise my tariff above to 25% if my MFN binding is at 2% uh, from the WTO. I can't threaten that in a bilateral negotiation. So imagine what it would be like to renegotiate the terms of NAFTA with the US if the US didn't feel constrained to its WTO commitments. Whoops, uh, actually the US obviously doesn't feel constrained to its WTO commitments. Here's Donald Trump. Uh, crowing about how he has just used the 25% uh, tariff that was imposed on steel to bargain or to help him get leverage to bargain down uh, a good deal for the U.S. and NAFTA. And that's where the U.S.-Korea is explicitly that. The uh, U.S.-Korea has now agreed to uh, certain renegotiations in order to avoid this steel tariff, which is well beyond the WTO commitments, and it's just something that the U.S. has, uh, has done. Okay. Final, uh, final statement, uh, implication, I think, is that the UK's best post-Brexit option is to help strengthen and re-energize the WTO, even if it also plans to negotiate PTAs, unless it wants to be bargaining with a country that uh, is using these kind of threats that are uh, beyond WTO commitments to, to get what it wants. Final advice, keep calm. <laughs> Thanks very much. So as I said, uncommon, uh, and in that sense, new perspectives to what we mostly hear in the debate here. We'll now hear two responses. Uh, Alan Winters first. Thank you very much, Martin. Thanks everyone uh, for coming. Uh, I'm going to um, jump off from uh, where Bob stopped, partly because I got Bob's slides a few days ago and I didn't get Michael's, but also partly because I want to argue that there's, in Brexit, something uh, slightly more complicated going on. Um, and I am really persuaded that Mr. Trump is probably a more serious thing for us to worry about than Brexit, but Brexit is ours, we can do something about it, and therefore that's, in a sense, where the policy leverage is. Uh, so, Bob's told us that uh, the terms of trade theory tells us that uh, giving up in deep integration is no big deal, and that indeed giving up preferential integration is no big deal either. And therefore, the best post-Brexit option is to support the WTO. I am absolutely persuaded that supporting the WTO is a good thing. He also tells us with the uh, commitment theory that uh, it makes sense to negotiate where deep PTA, deep, negotiate deep PTAs only where the commitment makes sense. That's moderately close to tautological, and I sort of want to pick a, a little bit at that. Uh, behind uh, Bob's presentation is a very elegant paper, which he did send me, and it's sort of, it, it's essentially the sort of terms of trade model that Bob and Kyle uh, Bagwell have uh, been uh, using for quite a while, and it's a, it's a very uh, powerful, insightful model. So we've got a model with sort of national instruments and countries linked together by a sort of externality. They can affect each other, and that's why you have to have agreements to try and get hold of that. 
Um, Bob defines some instruments as being sufficiently domestic and that sovereignty is violated, the gains in sovereignty are if in some sense you can prevent uh, your arrangements with other countries from constraining your choices over those uh, sufficiently domestic instruments. And again, in a sense, the question uh, at a practical level is, so what's sufficiently domestic? What's uh, an unacceptable uh, degree of constraint? So I want to deal with uh, two elements of this, uh, both sort of the Brexit-related or British Britain-related uh, elements. First, preferences in the WTO, and then secondly, uh, the deep, uh, deep integration. Uh, I've spent most of my life drizzling about um, regional trading arrangements. Some of you may even know that. And it's important to remember you know, that uh, tariffs are just taxes, taxes on imports, and trade preferences are giving somebody you like a tax break. Put like that, it doesn't sound like automatically going to be great policy. Indeed, there can be costs, exactly as Bob said, of trade diversion. So on free trade agreements that Britain might or might not sign, there is at least a trade-off to be made, at least a case for doing serious analysis. But will the UK throwing its weight behind the WTO really change things? There's been a lot of brave talk. Um, I found one speech from Liam Fox uh, recently uh, where we're going to give clear leadership to be a staunch defender of trading rights. We're going to forge the way on liberalisation of those areas where the WTO and other bodies have not extended their reach. Wonderful. Exactly what we ought to be doing are we going to achieve anything? And just a small figure of shares of global GDP. So going around clockwise, if you can't read it from there, the US, 24%, the EU, without us, 18%, China, 15%, Japan, 7%, all independent members of the WTO, all responsible for the way the WTO works, and we're in a pickle. Uh, Britain, 3%. The idea that we are just going to change the dynamic of the WTO by suddenly waking up and saying, you know, guys, you've forgotten about Ricardo or forgotten about trade liberalisation isn't very plausible. So while we certainly ought to support the WTO, it's not actually a strategy, a practical strategy for um, maximising or even uh, in perhaps improving uh, British welfare. OK, so the rest of what I want to say is about, so when are deep trade agreements likely to make sense. And this is really uh, the nub of the issue. Uh, the nub of the issue. You know, the, the gains from them might be small, but on the other hand, the gains from them uh, might actually be quite large. And I don't think one can necessarily answer that a priori, but at least there is a case to be made. I want to sort of consider just a very, very simple issue of choosing standards. I do understand that the EU doesn't quite impose harmonised standards on everyone, but you know, to a first approximation we can think of the following. So here's an issue, I'm not going to say what it is. Uh, the UK makes a choice about its standard, the EU makes a choice about its standards, standards labelled A and B, and uh, the EU, which I've put in red, prefers B, the UK in black prefers A and I've got a payoff matrix. And so the ideal situation is that we have harmonized standards around my standards. So in the top left-hand corner, the UK has got a payoff of 10, the EU a payoff of five. Uh, uh, down in the bottom right-hand corner, the, the converse. Uh, we have converged, but we're converged on the EU standard. If we have different standards, if the UK was to adopt the EU standard and the EU to adopt the UK standard, we'd both lose. We, don't, we wouldn't want to go there. No one would end up there. The real issue is this top right-hand corner where the returns to having different standards are such that I put them down six and six. Little example. The point about this matrix is it's the positions of cooperation where we have the same standard which generate the most welfare are not sustainable. Because if you look at the first row, where Britain is, um, sorry, where the EU has converged on the British standard if for, a, uh, for a payoff of five, it could get a payoff of six if it defected uh, to the second column. In other words, here's a situation where there's welfare to be won, but in the absence of any agreement, there's a coordination problem. What does the EU do? What does the single market do? It brings another one of these issues to the table. 
And now you can see they're exactly the same, identical sort of payoffs, patterns, and so on. But now we can see that there is a solution, which is on one of the issues we converge around the British standard, and one of the issues we converge around the EU standard. Uh, net welfare, we've got optima, uh, the optimal outcome uh, socially in, in both of these markets. So the optimal solution is that we trade, uh, there's a sort of the trade that I've highlighted, but that clearly requires binding commitments. It clearly requires that the EU believes that Britain won't defect on the second issue and that the uh, UK believes the EU won't defect on the first issue. If you think that these standards are there to help long-run investment decisions, uh, maybe building stuff, but certainly committing intellectual property and so on, then you can see why having this deep agreement, which impinges on the right to choose standards, is nonetheless uh, economically uh, efficient. So, the second dimension is what constitutes domestic. I constantly find it amazing that there's a group of people who think it's absolutely fundamental that Scotland remain in the, Europe, in the uh, United Kingdom, but that Britain leaves the European Union. I just don't get why that is the optimal size. And since Bob's from New Hampshire, is it the US that's optimal? Is it New Hampshire? Is it Dartmouth? Is it the locality where Bob lives? Somehow, if we want to talk about sovereignty, we've got to know over what, what realm we are willing to cooperate because it's good for us. And anyway, actually, when I look at the world, remember that little diagram with 3%, how much sovereignty do you actually get? For sure, you can go off and have your own unique standards, but if it prevents you from trading with 97% of the rest of the world, or only trading on very unfavorable uh, terms, then indeed, you actually don't de facto have a lot of sovereignty. So where's the EU stand on this? I want to just finish off by making a few comments about what Mr. Davis has referred to as CETA++++. We've done some analysis on this in the UK TPO. The basic point that the EU has is you are either in or you are out. And if you're in, we'll give you a few derogations for really important political things. Britain as a member already has derogations. Uh, the working time directive and so on. And if you're outside, we'll give you a few concessions to be nice to you. CETA gets a little bit of uh, access to certain services markets in Europe. Uh, Canada uh, does. And so that you, know, you can come a little bit towards the centre. What the EU has been really clear about is that this sort of UK fantasy in the middle of half in, half out is not on offer. That's the British position. So we might get a little bit more than Norway, we might get a little bit more than Canada, sort of coming in from the two ends, but we will not get a situation that is neither identifiably in or identifiably out. So even if we could get CETA++ with lots of sectoral agreements, we won't, but even if we could, is that equivalent to what we've got in the single market? And the answer is no, it's not, uh, for two reasons, which I will sketch through very quickly. The first is the single market contains a number of architectural features. The first and most important is the European Court of Justice. Every one of us in this room, no, everyone who's a European citizen in this room can institute a law case that ultimately might end up in, some, in front of the same court and be arbitrated according to the same set of rules. That's hugely important, particularly for trading services, which is a, a UK focus, because you pretty much got to buy the service before you work out it doesn't do what it says on the tin. So this single system, free of politics, it's not in intergovernmental, it's supragovernmental, uh, gives a great deal of commercial confidence that I won't invest in something and suddenly have it taken away by fiat. Second thing, movement of people. Again, for services trade, vitally important. We could do all of this by internet. We have the technology now that you need not have bothered to come to Brighton, and yet you did. You are proving that face-to-face -face contact for services transactions is really important. And we can't get around that. And if you're going to put barriers in the way, make it complicated, mean people have to plan these trips, they're not going to happen with the same frequency. And third, some people say it's the most important, but may or may not be, Data transfer. The EU has quite rigorous rules on privacy and data transfer. They're going to become more rigorous in May this year. 
And frankly, if you don't adhere to those, moving data around, which is the uh, heart of a services, many services transactions, in fact, you know, we're going to find ourselves squeezed out of European um, uh, uh, services markets. Final point, there's automaticity. Again, we have signed into a system that says, look, we will adopt whatever is going on. We may not like it, but if in some sense the collective decision is that it's the right way to go, then we'll go along with it automatically. You do not have to worry whether suddenly you'll find Britain defecting. We are proving that defecting is quite hard work. And therefore, on the sort of day-to-day -day decisions until Brexit was invented, you know, traders had a pretty, pretty large amount of confidence. The free trade agreement, the sort of CETA++ idea that the British government has suggested of three baskets, things we cohere on, things we might cohere on, and things we won't cohere on, is really uh, just a claim that the UK will diverge from European standards at a time of its own choosing, at its own discretion, at a time of its own choosing. That's not the basis on which we're going to make a satisfactory long-term commercial uh, arrangements. And therefore, essentially, the absence of the single market, even if we have agreements in all these services, is not going to do the trick to which we've become useful. And with that, I'll say thank you. Wait a second, is, is Brexit a good idea? Because I, I thought we were on a page that it wasn't. Um, we're in the midst of a huge backlash against globalization. I think one of the really interesting things is that the common thread running through both Bob Steger's comments and Michael Berta's comments is, wait a second, maybe the British are onto something here. Um, Bob has emphasized that the costs of leaving a deep agreement, deep integration with the European Union, might be small relative to the gains that could be had from increased sovereignty and increased control over a wide range of economic policies. Michael has pointed out that while globalization has brought benefits throughout Europe, throughout the world, when we look at labor markets, there's a lot of workers who aren't happy in many cases, the little guy has been left behind. Okay. And so the question that I think Brexit is raising, and it's a very important question, is has the European project and is the depth of European economic integration, has it gone too far? Policy prescriptions, if we think that maybe European integration did go too far, or at least it proceeded at a pace at which populations in Europe were not really prepared to cope with the pace of integration is that, you know, Bob recommends, well, maybe what needs to happen is what we learned is that Britain could step back from deep integration with the EU, where they've integrated over many, many different dimensions, and switch its focus to developing and extending and deepening, or extending its participation in a shallow multilateral agreement like the World Trade Organization, that would give the country more sovereignty. There are still issues at the WTO, but that might be the best way forward. Michael has said, well, we have these different pillars of what the European project is. Maybe what Brexit is highlighting is actually free mobility of people was too much too soon. It creates real costs, and maybe the way to save the European project is to give up on freedom of movement and save the customs union and all the benefits that come from goods and services market integration. Okay. So in general, I 
do think that when Britain leaves, because it seems like that is going to happen, I think Bob is giving the right advice, which is the way forward for the UK should be to seek integration and support for multilateral organizations, multilateral agreements like the WTO. Because the benefit of a trade agreement, as he said, is removing distortions caused by a variety of different policies in, local, in removing domestic distortions. If we go down the route of having a sequence of bilateral trade agreements with every country in the world, all we are doing are multiplying the, the local distortions that trade agreements were intended to get rid of. Okay. So what I want to do, though, in my remarks, is I want to push back against this first idea of Actually, is it, is it not so costly to leave the EU? Because I think maybe for Britain it is going to turn out to be um, pretty costly. Okay. And so I want to remind us all that, well, wait, what happened to all those doom and gloom forecasts we had circa the spring of 2016? Many very sensible economists predicted there, there was going to be a big trade and growth slowdown if Britain voted to leave the, UK, leave the European Union. But what we've seen since June 2016 is imports, exports, GDP growth, they've all kind of pottered along. In some cases, there's been a little bit of growth here and there. Does that empirical experience since June 2016 imply that Brexit doesn't matter? Or is the problem that the real costs have yet to come? And I would argue, um, is it correct to argue that the costs of leaving the EU are small? I'm concerned that they are not, that they're actually substantial. Just to bring this in context, here is a graph of export growth from an ONS report. Blue is export value from Britain to the world, P times Q. Yellow is export volume, just Q. And what you see with the black vertical line is June 2016. We left the EU and exports grew. I'm going to return to the point that the value of exports grew more than the quantity. Okay, well, is it surprising that export growth rose after we voted to leave the EU. Um, increases in tariffs are still years away. We don't yet have customs inspections. Should we have expected export growth to be impacted by the vote? So we have a literature, theoretical and empirical, on the, one of the values of trade agreements is the certainty they provide to exporters over future policy. And so specifically, Research looking at the Portuguese accession to the EU, looking at China's exports to the United States upon its accession to the WTO, both of these studies have found that if you increase the certainty that today's tariff will persist into the future and the likelihood of an increase in the tariff has disappeared, what we observe from Portuguese and Chinese firms is increases in market entry, increases in investment, and increases in export sale. If we look at the other side, so I've done some research looking at what happens when the level of the tariff doesn't change, but there's an increase in the threat of future tariffs against Chinese firms in the contents of anti-dumping, we find decreased entry by Chinese firms into foreign markets. So this literature on trade policy uncertainty suggests we should have seen some hit. We should have seen a hit to uh, UK exports, UK export growth after Brexit, that didn't materialize. Now, is the, does the UK face trade policy uncertainty? This is a graph that quantifies the bars when added all together represent the total sterling value of UK exports to the European Union in 2016. The different vertical bars represent different sectors of the economy. If we go across the, the largest bars, the first one is fuel, the second tall bar is chemicals, then the other two tall bars are machinery equipment and transportation equipment. Green represents export value that is not going to face a tariff no matter what happens because those are products for which the European Union's external tariff vis-a-vis the rest of the world is zero. So no deal, no problem. Maybe we worry about customs inspections. But we do have... It, sectors of, or areas of UK exports that are red and orange, those are products that are going to face high tariffs if we ended up in a no deal scenario. Okay, so 25% of UK exports are at risk of uncertainty. But so, why didn't we see any hit to UK exports post the, the uh, decision to leave? Well, sorry. Sterling fell. 
and it fell a lot. And the sterling fall softened the blow to exports that occurred at the time we had um, exit. So the yellow line in this graph is the trade weighted value of sterling against a basket of currencies. You can see between October 2015 at the peak down to the sort of trough, October 2016, a 20% vol in sterling value. Notice that in the middle of this long depreciation, we have the Brexit vote. That's the vertical black line. Okay, so we get this big depreciation. Um, at the same time, the two blue lines, the light blue line is um, the price, uh, sort of a, a price index of British exports. Okay, so British export prices are rising as sterling is falling in value. And also, the price of imported inputs that will be used into the production of British goods are also rising. Okay, so what do we know about how depreciations, sorry, updates are pending. Let's do those later. So we have these two opposing forces acting on exports potentially. Increased over uncertainty over trade policy might have deterred some export growth. The sterling depreciation provided an offsetting boost. What, what impact does a 20% devaluation depreciation of a currency have on export growth, uh, export volumes? What impact does it have on the little guy or labor? Well, what we saw was very little increase in export volume despite a very large depreciation. So what we didn't see was any translation of this big depreciation into a big manufacturing job growth. Well, why? This brings us to the exchange rate disconnect puzzle. If we think about exporters that have market power in the goods they export, their price and their quantity are a strategic decision. So what they do in response to a devalue depreciation is strategic. We've got lessons from abroad, previous studies, that have looked at micro firm level evidence from Belgium, France, and China have tried to help us understand how do firms respond to big movements in currency. So I'll, I'll talk just about, um, in the interest of time, the evidence from France and the evidence from China. So in French studies, what we've seen is the most productive French exporters in response to a depreciation raise their markups more than less productive French exporters and they also increase their export quantities less than less productive exporters. Okay, so what they do is they, they adjust prices, they grab profits, and they stabilize output in terms of the export side. When we look at Chinese firms, we have a similar um, way of approaching this. Market power of firms depends on the nature of the good traded, and the products matter. Firms that are exporting highly differentiated products raise markups on, good, on those goods more than exporters selling less differentiated, more commodity-like products. Further, if we look at how quantities respond to these markup changes, we see firms that are um, exporting highly differentiated goods, they don't raise quantity much. Quantity is relatively inelastic in response to big markup changes. Okay, so just to elaborate on this point, Product market competition depends on the type of good. These are two differentiated manufactured goods that China exports. One is tomato paste, one is tractors. The firms hold similar amounts of market power. You see this is a graph that shows export price dispersion of three firms in China. Triangles are one firm, circles are a second firm, squares are a third firm. Y, I'm sorry, the x-axis is price dispersion in 2007 relative to the firm's mean price of that one product across all destinations. The y-axis is the same firm, it's price dispersion in the following year, 2007. What we see is that red represents an appreciation of the currency, the product, uh, the currency in the country where the product is being exported. Appreciations are associated with markup increases for these firms, okay? So one minute left. What we see again, just to sort of hammer home the point, highly differentiated goods, we see big markup adjustments when we face big depreciations. So if we want to bring this back to what happened with Brexit, exporting firms adjust markups, 
when firms have market power, they raise domestic prices in, in sterling, they raise markups in to, to specific destinations, but they stabilize quantities. They book the profits from the depreciation, but the question is what do they do with those profits? And in particular, if we think about Brexit, what have firms done with the profits they made from the large sterling depreciation since June 2016? Did they invest? Are they developing new products? Are they raising the wages of workers? We don't know, but one of the big problems here is firms seem not to know what to do with those profits because they face a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen in the future. Okay. And so to wrap up in, I think, 30 seconds, one of the concerns here is that the prolonged uncertainty about what British firms can do, what markets they'll be able to reach, is having feedback effects on investment. This, in a sense, could be the hidden cost of Brexit there's investment not taking place today that's going to have longer term, in a sense, hidden costs tomorrow. Um, and so the big caveat I'd like to make about some of the points that Michael and Bob made is we don't want to be too relaxed about the costs of leaving the EU because I think they could be real and significant. Um, and so I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was all very, very exciting. Um, what I want to do, we're a little bit behind schedule because of the computer problems we started late, but I want to do a quick round uh, just here across the panel, uh, in part because the first two presenters may want to respond to the responses, uh, and then we'll open up to questions, uh, short and brief questions and comments from the audience. Uh, but I'd like to invite um, both uh, Michael and Robert to, uh, to respond to the response. Maybe I can start with you, uh, Robert. And there's, a, there's one thing I just wanted you to specify. Um, because of your skepticism of preferential trade agreements, should we take you to be saying that once the UK leaves the EU, it shouldn't even bother with a free trade agreement, a zero tariff agreement with the EU itself, the EU27, it should just go for some sort of you know, WTO push um, to get liberalization across the board, that it would be a mistake to do what the government is stating that it will do, which is to negotiate a zero tariff deal. Yeah, uh, so those were uh, great, uh, great responses and, and, and great question. And um, so let me, uh, let me say a couple things very quickly. One is, um, you know, I think the way one, I'm not sure I want to, uh, you know, kind of be on record as saying Brexit was a good thing. I don't, I don't necessarily, you know, say that. Uh, maybe it was, maybe it's not. It depends on what, uh, you know, what the UK does with it. Uh, and I agree with, uh, with Meredith that uh, there, there certainly are going to be costs. Uh, but I do also think that the costs are, uh, to some degree, uh, depend on what the UK does do with its Brexit, and some of those costs could be minimized uh, depending on, on what the UK does. And then that gets to your point is, should the UK be trying to minimize those costs by, uh, by seeking preferential agreements? And that's where my own view is, um, you know, uh, maybe uh, if in fact it's seeking preferential agreements that are giving it something didn't have as a member of the EU, and that might be seeking preferential agreements that still allows it to have some freedom to do on some dimensions what it wants to do. Uh, well, that could be uh, valuable, perhaps, to a country, and so I could see at the end of the day that uh, that you know that might be potentially worth the cost. Uh, it would just depend on uh, you know on what what it was that uh, that uh, that Britain was seeking. What it wouldn't, uh, you know, what seems like it wouldn't be worth it is. Uh, going right back into um, you know some kind of uh, uh, of preferential agreement that includes uh, a lot of uh, of depth and uh, then the question has to be well what did you what did you gain from from brexit in the first place and you know another way to kind of put I think my overall view is 
know, as we look around the world, as a, as a trade economist who works on trade agreements, I would be, uh, over the long run, I would be much more worried if countries were leaving the WTO than if they were leaving their preferential agreements. That's, a, that's one way to put because I think the WTO is well designed to handle a real issue, uh, and of course it can be improved, and there are there are there are issues with it, but it's got fundamental uh, fundamental design features that I think are, uh, are make it a legitimate institution, uh, and I can defend it on uh, you know on, in, in ways like that. Uh, so if if countries you know said we want we want to we want to leave uh, free trade agreements, well that to me would be less of a problem than if they said we want to get out of the WTO. That, maybe I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, exactly. But you want to respond to the views of the sponsors. Yeah. Just, just briefly, I, I'm sorry you didn't get my slides. I, I, sent, I think I sent them to you, but uh, <laughs> uh, no, no, ma no matter. I'll jump in. I, I think... Um, these comments were fantastic, excellent, uh, deepening my understanding. You know, I, I, I was trying to understand the positive side of why this is all happening. And it's happening in the United States as well. It's not just happening in the UK, it's also happening potentially in Central Europe. Uh, there's a movement in Germany, you know, so who knows what's, what's happening around the corner. And given that tr trade and services is very hard to distinguish between migration, and a lot of what is going on right now is Polish workers are being posted in Germany and the UK, uh, it's it's going to have a huge effect. Um, I think for the UK to leave uh, will have a big effect on European labor markets on the continent. Um, and I, you know, both positive and negative senses. I think uh, Polish entrepreneurs will have uh, much cheaper labor as a result. Uh, and Poland may develop in a very different way than it would had uh, the 800,000 or 900,000 that are currently in the UK right now uh, stay and continue to improve the quality of your plumbing and your painting and your <laughs> interior decorating. Um, these are things that uh, you know very deep, deep points. I, I like the idea of 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 of, of, the, of WTO also as just a way of tying the hand of policymakers. So you know Trump has shown us that this is in, in, impossible to control. In the end, they just do what they want. Politicians will do what they want. And so we have to understand why people are not getting uh, what they what they deserve. And I think the the fact that enough people support the Brexit movement means we have to pay attention to the losers and understand their pain. And if if, if you know, I don't think it's all imagined. And the little guy um, hasn't seen it yet, and I agree with you completely. I think it's coming. Uh, the depreciation will continue long enough to postpone the inevitable, and it may come out to be much uh, much worse. But I'll, we'll come back to that in a second. I think I think it Thanks. Um, Alan and Meredith, if you don't mind, I'm going to take a few questions, just so we don't run out of time prematurely, as it were. Uh, so I'll, I'll just see if there are, let's see, how many questions, how many people are, okay. Uh, so I, I'm going to just do three. The, the two people next to one another up there, and Chris Giles. Okay. Uh, I'm Steve Machen from the LSE. Okay. And, and please try to keep it in one or two sentences. I'd like to say two things. Um, the first is that from everything we know, the costs of hard Brexit look like they're going to be pretty big. Uh, they're not small at all. Uh, that's from the work my colleagues at CEP have done. Uh, to standard trade models. It's also from actually looking at the data about what's happened subsequently. I mean, real wages are falling again uh, because prices have gone up um, post-Brexit. Post and so I think it's pretty absurd to think that actually the costs are going to be pretty low to start with. Uh, they're going to be big. Whether they're a one-off hit or not, and then the economy recovers, is a much more sensible line to take. Um, the second thing is, of course, uh, more interaction, close interaction with the WTO, uh, conditional on leaving is a good thing. But the UK is much too weak in, in regard to that. The 3% number that Alan Wintz has put up is obviously extremely sensible. And also, there's no political will. There's no political will for that. And so to think that's going to happen without any big change is, is really pretty crazy, I think. Thank you. Marina Della Giusta from University of Reading. Uh, I'd like to hear something which I was hoping would come up about integrated production and about the fact that most, much of trade is intra-industry trade. Uh, in the context of leaving the EU and the costs. Thanks. Chris Charles down here. Chris Charles on the Financial Times. There's a question from Michael. Uh, you've said a number of times that uh, we need to pay more attention to the little guy and worried about inequality. Inequality in the UK has been flat for 30 years. 
It did grow a lot in the late 1980s. And the, uh, the main constituency for voting leave was older people who've done best within our income distribution over the last 10 years. So, and the young people who voted to remain have done worst on a cohort and an age effect. So does that make you question your analysis? So I'll ask Meredith and Alan to comment first, since you didn't um, comment in the first round. And then Michael, you'll, uh, you'll have to address the question to you. Um, so I'll take up the question. So Steve Machen pointed out big costs of Brexit. Um, I'm in agreement when he says there's no political will to go to the WTO. My question is, is there no political will in Britain or is there no political will in the world? In a sense, there's sort of an answer of yes to both of those. So there's a, I think in the part of the US, a real stepping back from WTO. I think there are other countries in the world. So I think if you talk to the Japanese, the Australians, they would like more weight at the WTO because they are high income, smaller countries. And so there is, there are some countries that would like more to happen there. I think there are also important problems um, in a sense. One of the issues here is actually some deeper integration issues like the role of state aid and the role of the state in countries and how that plays into trade is actually a big issue at the WTO with the current tension between the US and China is basically about Chinese state aid and the weakness of WTO instruments to cope with that. So that's one issue. I'll also just touch on this question about integrated production. I think that's a huge cost. It didn't have any chance to talk about. But the first thing is the sterling depreciation has raised prices of imported inputs. So there's, there's that. When we have time delays at the border from customs inspections, this could be very damaging to UK production um, because it is integrated in these supply chains. What does that mean in terms of policy? Well, going forward, it is going to be vital that whatever is negotiated allows for accumulated rules of origin. Um, so one of the more positive things I've heard recently is the Japanese Business Association has come out and said they want European FTAs with respect to China, uh, with respect to Japan, to automatically accumulate all of the rules of origin with the UK. So the Japanese position is we want to continue to treat the UK and Europe as an integrated market for tariff purposes, and we want accumulation. So there's there's some evidence that that will happen. So I'll, I'll stop there and I'll leave um, Chris Giles' question for Michael. Uh, yes, if I could. Um, so I agree with Steve. Thank you. And I won't say anything more. Um, uh, the, on, integration, uh, on integrated production, exactly as Meredith said, huge problem. I think it's not only um, a question of sort of rules of origin and accumulation. The thing that was worrying, I think, um, most um, uh, people in integrated production chains is in fact the, um, uh, the potential time uh, involved in, cost in crossing borders. I've seen recently some very, very alarming figures about um, even with, uh, say, the Channel Tunnel, how much delay there might well be unless we invest hugely. Um, la we've become very used to sort of just-in-time delivery, uh, just-in-sequence delivery apparently is that on steroids, and uh, it is the case that the reliability of the Channel Tunnel in a sense, in terms of not being dependent on weather, generally evading most of the queues, has become quite an important part for a number of sectors uh, in the production. Uh, and so I think it is a huge, huge worry. There was a report last week by something called SIPS, which is the Chartered Institute of something or the other, uh, who do uh, production chains, and they said one in seven companies is already starting to resource um, and it said that there's a, a generalized, a sort of rather suspicion in Europe of relying on British companies. I mean, if, it, if one in seven really is, is moving now and there's a more generalized suspicion, uh, in a sense, it's difficult to pick up in the modeling, but it, it, it could be very, um, uh, very disruptive for intermediate trade indeed. So, I, uh, yeah, the little guy. Um, I have different numbers. The numbers I have from the OECD say that the in increase in inequality of uh, Gini um, 
in the last two decades has been the highest in the UK and the United States. It's risen, yeah, I mean, we, we can show data afterwards, but uh, it's, it's risen the least in countries, you know, like in the Scandinavian realm. And I think that has to do with, uh, again, compensating the losers in some sense, be it, you know, lifelong learning or uh, retraining programs. The, the Germans have, have actually been very successful in the hearts reforms, avoiding increase in poverty, despite what you hear in the political discussion. Actually, they are quite, quite impressive on that. They haven't had any, they're the ones that haven't had the increase in inequality since the, since the 90s or since the, since the late 90s. So, and as far as the old people versus the younger concerned, I think this is a great example of where you don't want to let uh, democracy go too far. I mean, in Switzerland, people are trained to do this. They vote every other weekend on everything. But in the UK, this is never done, and th you don't want to leave these things up for chance. I think, I think in the end, we all, most of us understand it was a bad decision, uh, and some people got the agenda and controlled a lot of people's opinions, maybe using Cambridge Analytica and uh, clever, <laughs> clever, uh, and, and as a Facebook user myself, I, I, I feel that I've been manipulated as well. But um, we can't, we can't uh, you know, I think we have to maybe revisit to save this. I think saving the customs union is the biggest gain. I mean, I, I, I go with the trade integration so deep now between Germany and the UK. People, I didn't get to talk about this, but I'm, I'm very concerned about that. And, and German, German, uh, Germans are, are, are going to lose an ally in, uh, in Brussels as well, which, is, which means a lot. Um, but I, I think uh, we need to we need to maybe take a step back. And one step back would be to maybe I would give I would give the UK a break on on people. I think the UK took a lot of a, a big hit from Poland and from Romania. And in, uh, in, in, and I had the data. It's quite impressive. The Germans were able to deflect that and get their house in order. And now, of course, the interest is to go back to where they came from because they can do great over there. So uh, there's got to be some second best out, out there. Michael, just just a once, can you can you just say very quickly, you you're more worried about the UK leaving the customs union than about regulatory divergence. Is that right? Absolutely. Well, I'm, no, I'm, well I think they go in hand in hand. I think uh, uh, regulatory divergence will also hurt trade. Um, that's what Alan was saying. Uh, there's a there's a huge gain from coordination. I mean, the United States. If you look at the United States, the history of the United States, the Progressive Era was based on overriding state rights. If you look very carefully. Up until the Great Depression, I mean, the FDIC was another overriding of state rights to regulate banking. You know, the the, uh, the regulation of pharmaceutical products, interstate trade. This is all the triumph of a federal system, uh, which gr brought great advantages to corporations actually to give uh, standardized products to lots of Americans. And I think this is kind of what Europe is missing out on. They don't really the, the EU has not marketed its strongest suit, which is just harmonizing on some regulation. Unfortunately, most of the regulations are German because the Germans are very good at that, but it doesn't have to be the case. You know, the UK has incredible creativity. Being outside is a loser situation. I think being outside and not being able to influence like Norway, I mean, they, they, they pay a lot of money uh, to keep people from coming in and taking advantage of their social system, but in the end, they've given up the chance to, to, to be at the table, and, and it's, it's the exit versus voice problem. You know? I think I said that in my letter. Let's have one more round of questions. Let's see. Okay, here and here, and is there one more? Don't see any hands in the back, and all the way in the back there. We have a microphone down here, please, and then here. Second row. Thank you, Joe Grice from Office of National Statistics. Um, my understanding of uh, the inequality figures was actually to Chris Giles, but I don't think either way that actually affects your point, Michael. The elephant in the room that didn't really come out of the discussion for me is we've had an economy which for 60 or 70 years systematically made better people better off. And we've now had 10, 12 years where people haven't got better off, where productivity has been more or less flat. And so there are more uh, losers and less winners as compared to where we might have been. And that seems to me to be a pretty powerful dynamic in the kind of decision we had. And I just wonder whether going forward, then the real issue is not so much about Brexit per se, but what do we have to do to get the economy to start producing better living standards again? Uh, it's been quite good at producing jobs, by the way. We've got lots of jobs. But people are actually not paid that well as compared to where they might have been. The productivity gap is now 20%, which you know, dwarfs some of the things we've been talking about. Brexit, post-Brexit policy might be part of that issue about how we get the economy to start making people better off again. But it might turn out to be a very partial, if not marginal, part of the consideration. I just wonder if the policy 
focus hasn't got a bit kind of uh, bedazzled by Brexit as opposed to the wider question. Thank you. Yeah, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm Paul Weapons from the European Institute in Germany. Um, I'm wondering, I mean, what is the, the logic of uh, going for a WTO integration when the United States at the same time is undermining the WTO? I mean, the appellate body will not be active as of 2019, so I do not understand the logic. Then there's a second point which, is, uh, which hasn't been mentioned so far, and this is foreign direct investment. Actually, as I, as I have mentioned in, in the book, uh, An Accidental Brexit, and, and highlighted, I mean, everybody talks about the cost of Brexit in terms of what is the decline of GDP, but it's what is the decline of GNP, and if, for instance, and now the share of foreign ownership in the UK capital stock is 16 percent, and in 2025 it will be 30 percent, then you will transfer 4.3 percent of uh, national income to the, to the headquarters abroad. So foreign direct investment, of course, is then part of the multinationalization aspect. And final question, I mean, when you, Michael, talk about the question, you know, the influence or the question about um, the perceptions of globalization, I, I find there are these surveys from the U.S. which show that people overestimate grossly the uh, degree of globalization. And then I look at the digital social services and I find we economists, we do not explain enough. We leave the field and the internet to crazy people who get a lot of followers and, and here we have a gap. Thank you very much. You, you, did, you did talk about perception quite a lot. One more question uh, at the top there. Thanks very much. Peter Holmes, the uh, Sussex UK TPO. Um, my question is partly actually directed at Martin. Um, it's whether in order to deal with the adverse political reaction to globalization and so on, the right approach is targeted uh, trade adjustment assistance or European Globalization Fund or more general, uh, for example, basic income, or does the answer lie in the labor market? If you ask me, I, I say all of the above. Um, I'm going to... Uh, I will actually say all of the above, but I, I'm just going to jump off from that question to point out that all the questions were really a form of what on earth do we do now, uh, which may have little to do with the exact form of Brexit and much more to do with appropriate kind of big uh, domestic policies. So I think I'm going to kind of package all the questions into that form. What should the UK or other countries in a similar situation do now? in order to deal with these frustrations that, as you point out, exist everywhere. Um, so I'll ask the question, a sort of summary question in that form and let all of you kind of put into that what you wish as your concluding comment. So I'll just take it from Meredith and go along the table. Um, so I'll, I'll take the productivity question, the FDI question. Um, what, do, what do we know about FDI moving in response to tariffs and tax incentives? And so. It's two things we can learn from the U.S. So first of all, in the 80s, the U.S. put on a lot of import restrictions um, against autos. What was the consequence? The Japanese moved production into the United States. Um, we still produce a lot of autos by Japanese-owned firms in the United States. In some sense, this was very good for the U.S. because, it, you know, this is how we got better technology, better manufacturing um, work. In some sense, though, what that tariff did, I think, is just drew forward in time investment in FDI that would have happened anyway, because what the Japanese brought to the U.S. were types of vehicles that didn't exist in the United States and weren't being produced there. So they were filling a market niche. So the question with Brexit is if the EU ends up putting on very border barriers, either tariffs or just delayed time costs, are we going to see the FDA that is in, currently in Britain jumping into France or jumping into Poland? Um, that would have negative productivity consequences. The other thing we can see from the U.S. is if we look over time at the distribution of manufacturing activity, I think one of the things that we don't think enough about is international tax competition. The fact that within the United States over time, we've seen a lot of entry, both of foreign multinationals, but you know, where are autos now made? They're made in the South, they're made in the West, and we had this big movement away from the upper Midwest where we have stricter labor market regulations and higher taxes to lower tax jurisdictions in the South. And I think that is something that when we talk about international trade agreements, we want to 
obviously tax policy is an issue of national sovereignty and governments should be free to set tax policy as they see fit. But there's also this issue of tax competition that exists and we haven't really come to, I mean, we haven't done enough in research as international economists as, in terms of that public finance question that I think is very important. Yeah, I think that's a great, uh, a great point. I'd like just to support that. I think this is a great opportunity for the UK to give us some more data because they're definitely going to cut taxes as much as it takes to get the FDA to come back. Um, and I, I, you know, maybe that's a good thing. Uh, there, there are people in, in, on the continent that think that, uh, that the French approach, which is to harmonize taxes in a lot of different areas, is, a, is just going to raise the average level of taxes and distortions. Uh, I just wanted to answer your point about, I agree completely, I, but this is a macro question. Why is pe why has productivity growth slowed over the past two or three decades? And I really do think it has. You look at the, any data, even in China, TFP has slowed down in, in growth. And I think when you have less to share, um, you have less to... Con so it, you really do have a zero-sum game. And I'm, I'm, I'm concerned um, the, way, the way the world got out of that in, in the 1930s was World War II. You know, this is not what we want to have. Uh, but it's clear that a lot of government spending in, on projects that have high productivity uh, spin-offs uh, is, is a horrible way of doing it. But I'm afraid, uh, you know, we have to be concerned about that. I think more interesting would be for, for the UK to stay in the European project. I think Europe, Europeans are very creative and uh, the, the EU uh, needs the UK. The educational sector is an incredible lighthouse to all of us. You know, I mean, I, I send my best students to, to the UK and, uh, and the United States and I'm very proud of that. Um, and this is where the, the new ideas are coming from. If you want to get TFP growth up again, we got to we got to get more money from Brussels to the to EU, uh, to um, UK universities, not less. I think everyone here is going to agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let me. I, I I was going to comment on FDI, but I, but uh, Meredith and uh, Michael have done so. So let me just deal with Joe's point. Um, it is very clear that there are bigger problems in the world and bigger problems in Britain than Brexit. But to draw the conclusion that therefore we should stop fretting about Brexit seems to me to be completely misguided. Brexit, uh, the form of Brexit, but Brexit per se, is a clear and present danger. It is a gratuitous act, it is going to happen, and we just need to deal with it. We need to deal with it to get it off the table so that we can focus on dealing with Mr. Trump and dealing with productivity. So it just seems to me you know, that, that I entirely agree with you, but would have exactly the opposite conclusion. I would say, let us just focus on trying to get Brexit sorted and out of the way, uh, in or out, however, and then let's deal with some of the real problems. Mrs. May, when she became Prime Minister, made a wonderful egalitarian speech in Downing Street about the just, you know, the just managing and so on. What's happened? Well, exactly. Just, just, just distracted. It's very, it, yeah, Brexit has a series of costs that are actually a lot broader than just the stuff that we as economists can get hold of. So, you know, keep saying what you're saying, but um, I would draw a different, well, I would make sure the conclusion is the right one. <laughs> okay, uh, these are great, uh, great questions and comments. And uh, uh, let me just start quickly with the, the cost of Brexit. And uh, I agree completely, there are good, um, estimates out there, quantitative uh, models that have been used by people to, uh, to, uh, to calibrate and estimate these, these losses or costs. And uh, uh, certainly what I, you know, what I presented here is not a statement on those estimates because in some ways I'm asking a different question and trying to provide a different answer. Uh, those uh, are, are looking at uh, uh, you know, what would happen or what will happen in Britain uh, when it leaves the EU under various scenarios, um, and of course, at least my understanding of those estimates is uh, much of the cost is on non-tariff barriers and what's going to happen with non-tariff barriers. Those things are very hard to quantify, as we all know, so we all, of course, have to take with a grain of salt the numbers that are, that are there. But that said, my, uh, my statement here is really not that counterfactual. It is rather uh, in a world where we have um, uh, uh, deep integration agreements, if a country were to instead replace that with a well-working shallow integration agreement, how costly would it be? And there I would stand by the statement that in principle it need not be that costly. So that's a very different, you know, I don't want to go on record as saying I don't think the actual costs of Brexit 
is, is high or that these models, uh, modeling, are, are done poorly. I think they've done very well. But so I just want to be clear that my, my thought experiment is a different thought experiment. Having said that, uh, other points here that have been raised are really important, and that is, um, uh, you know, the WTO uh, is in trouble, and uh, the U.S. is uh, is really backing away, and it didn't start with Trump, unfortunately, uh, as was pointed out here. Uh, it happened under the uh, Obama administration with the beginnings of the uh, appellate body, lack of support for uh, for uh, putting in new appellate body judges, and, uh, and so there is a real question of... Uh, who, you know, where is that support going, and who who is going to stand up uh, to support to support that institution? But my own feeling is, especially in this time uh, when many many countries are uh, rethinking their commitment to the market access commitments they've made in the past, uh, uh, with uh, China uh, and the other BRICS now uh, uh, in ascendance, uh, WTO is well designed to allow governments to rethink those commitments and recalibrate their, uh, their levels of openness in a way that free trade agreements are not. Uh, free trade agreements do not have simple renegotiation uh, mechanisms that the WTO does have. It has a very uh, flexible way of allowing countries to, uh, to decide that in fact they need to, to back off of their commitments uh, somewhat, do so in an orderly that's the key, is that the WTO provides this legal mechanism uh, for, uh, for doing this, and, and to the extent that Trump and others uh, are beginning to, to uh, threaten that legal mechanism, I think that's the real cost of, uh, of the decline of the WTO. There's where I think the UK and all other countries who, uh, who have any interest in the world trading system that has some kind of a constitution uh, would really do well to do what they can to support the WTO that was my final point was, uh, you know, if you think that, well, free trade agreements are the way to go, uh, well, all the free trade agreements we, go, we negotiate up until now really from the background of the WTO or the GATT. Uh, that meant that there are some MFN tariffs that set the stage for a disagreement point to that negotiation. You don't have a WTO when you have a President Trump who basically says, blow past the binding to the WTO by imposing 25% tariffs and then saying, well, you won't have to pay them if you negotiate well enough. Something like that happened with the US and North Korea. We're going to have a very different set of free trade agreements in the future uh, that we, than we would have had if we had a well-operating WTO. So that's, that's my view is that you know, the UK can actually do something and the US needs to do more and all other countries it's in their interest to so whatever the disagreements may be here, everyone seems to be united against uh, Trump's sabotage of the WTO. Uh, Meredith, Michael, Alan, uh, Robert, thanks very much. Thanks to all of you as well. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>